get comfortable. Let me know when you're ready. Mr. Brown, if you're the appellant. Yes. Are you ready? You want to go first? Right. All right. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Okay, please support. I'm Steve Brand, Brand and Humphreys of Berman, here representing Mr. Tornado. I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time. All right. Uh, if I may. You got it. We believe that this appeal is resolved on two principles that are well familiar to every lawyer in this room. First, parties should resolve uh, their decision in a way that leads to a, a single exec executable judgment and one appeal. And secondly, uh, there is generally speaking no execution on a judgment until the entire dispute has been litigated and the entire case is finished. Here, the parties are litigating a dispute over a, uh, the operation and the sale of a... Well, let, let me ask you a question. It seems like you did everything you could to, to get one result, one dispute resolved in one proceeding, but there was an agreement that allowed arbitration, required arbitration on some of the proceedings, and a lawsuit on the other. And then it, it, was this trial strategy? They decided, I'm following my lawsuit. If they beat you to the finale, then they let the judge decide to go forward with the collection or not. And then you're worried about, well, if I win the lawsuit, I, I, I can't get my money back because I've already paid it out. So we're dealing with an abuse of discretion standard on appeal? Right. Okay. So yeah, you, you, you got right to the nub of it. The twist in this case is that the parties agreed that a small portion of their dispute had to be decided by an arbitrator. So we ended up with two proceedings. We have the arbitration dispute over what the parties have called the insider debt claim. And then we have the, the main claim, I'll call it. Which <clears> and this is by a form. mutual agreement that, that was entered into. Right. Yeah, was yeah. there anything in the mutual agreement that said, and by the way, you can't collect on the arbitration award, whoever prevails, until after the entire case is finished? Um, the, the agreement is silent. I mean, it could have, could have had that in there, though. That, that's something that could have been negotiated, but it wasn't. And then the court was asked to make a decision. So we're back to the abuse of discretion. I'm trying to find what, what is the abuse of discretion you're pointing to? Well, I would say first, just in response to you, your, your discussion of the agreement. There's certainly nothing in the agreement that would suggest that the parties intended that the parties would be able to collect on judgments in a piecemeal fashion. So the agreement is, is silent on that. I will certainly admit that, but there is nothing in the, in the agreement. So it doesn't allow it, nor does it prohibit it. Right. Okay. So why is it an abuse of discretion? I think the three points I would make is first, we have this underlying set of principles that suggest that you have one execution when it, when the case is done. There would be absolutely no question about the result if we didn't have this separate arbitration agreement. This was all one case and they resolved the, the, uh, uh, the insider debt claim first, um, but they still had the rest of the fraud claims to go. There is, everyone I think in this room would agree that the judge couldn't enter an executable judgment. Um, and the arbitration the was done. Well, so one thing that was curious, the arbitration award was not confirmed in the lawsuit, but in a separate lawsuit. Right. Okay. Well, they, that's, that was their choice. Instead of going back to the original lawsuit, which I think would have made more sense because then one judge would have been looking at the entire dispute as a whole, as opposed to two different judges looking at it. They chose to go ahead and, and confirm it. As, in, but the argument was case. still made before yeah. both, judge, both judges knew well what was going on. It wasn't like someone made an argument that should have been made or didn't didn't make an argument that should have been made. Well, the the, uh, the only judge that grappled with the issue of the execution was the judge in the uh, in the arbitration. But you all did, didn't you all seek consolidation? We, we did seek consolidation, which was uh, unfortunately denied. But so it seems to me that the real complaint here is is that the trial court abused its discretion in not consolidating the two cases. Right. Which leads me to the question I have for you, which is what is what is the strongest case reported decision that supports the notion that the refusal or failure to consolidate two actions is an abuse of discretion? Well, I, I, we're not attacking the the, uh, the consolidation. That's in the other case. There's well, no, there's but, but I'm suggesting that, that you are. Well, I think <laughs> certainly. I mean, in, in effect, that's what you're doing. You're saying. They chose to file this separate lawsuit. 
they should come together so that we can have the one lawsuit, one resolution, and that's the whole point of consolidation. But, yeah, and and um, but that the that judge in the consol in the in the main claim wasn't presented with the with the issues we have here now. Now they've gotten their their arbitration award, and the question is, do they get to execute it now, or should we wait until the end of the case to execute? Well, if it's a typical consolidation motion, it would be brought before the earlier case number, which would be the original underlying action. Right, you would bring it before the who? Presumably, that judge was familiar with the docket and was familiar with the background of that case. We would have brought up to that judge that, hey, there's this new lawsuit seeking to confirm the arbitration in this existing one. One lawsuit, one one result. Let's consolidate. The judge did deny that, and right. here we are. Here we are because, of course, we can't appeal that that the refusal to consolidate. So we're stuck back here again. Um, but I don't think that procedural dilemma impacts the merits. I think I, I think it's a, unless it does. I, <laughs> I think it's an abuse of discretion because first we all know that generally speaking there should be one execution. All right. Then secondly, Mr. Tornello has posted a bond in the entire amount of the judgment plus interest. So there is absolutely no question that they're getting the benefit of the arbitration. They've arbitrated we haven't challenged the confirmation of the award. We put the money in the bank. They're going to get their money. But we still believe we're going to ultimately have the net judgment once the fraud claims are resolved. So let, me, let, me press, let me press you on that a little bit. because, And I'll go with you on your argument that there's an abuse of discretion here. Can you tell me one reported case where a court has ever found there to be an abuse of discretion based upon collectability, potential collectability of a judgment? Um, no, I don't got it. In fact, usually appellate courts instruct trial courts, that's really not a consideration. Right. But again, that's not that we, that's a different situation than when you have the backdrop of a, of a single dispute between the parties that just happens because the procedural happenstance to be to be litigated in two different forms. And as I said, I'm not the, the main point we're making is we all know what the result would be if this was one case. Why? Should the result be any different just because it's split into two cases? I think that's the big question, particularly when our client has posted a bond that fully protects and they're going to get paid. And there's no protection well, going well, back the other way. If they post a bond and they know they're going to get paid, when would this payment occur? It'll it'll occur at the uh, at the end of the, uh, the okay. What year would that uh, what year would that take place? I mean, tomorrow, next year, ten years, five years. When the appeals are exhausted, I mean, I assume that's going to be their reason for opposing the delay. Right. And, and I would say that as part of the judge's exercise of discretion, the judge would have the ability to, to watch and monitor the, the proceedings in the other case. And if, if it becomes clear to the judge that the other case is dragging along, they can always go back to the judge and say, look, um, we, um, you, you originally stayed execution on this. It's taking too long. We should get our money now, but the, the, the judge never looked at that at all. What the judge looked at here was when you got an arbitration judgment, they're entitled to, um, to, to collect. Now, so we, we do have some case law that supports the, uh, the uh, um, a, a judge staying execution of the judgment. We've got the carpet um, concepts case out of this court where this court specifically said one of the remedies here would be just to stay the judgment pending uh, uh, pending the uh, resolution of the other arbitration. Well, and, and there's there's no question that the, the carpet case stands for the proposition that the court can do that. Right. But to sort of follow up again on what Judge Lucas was saying, there are no cases out there that say the court errs by failing to do that. Correct? There are no cases out there. Uh, we, yeah, we don't have a case you know, on our, our facts on that. But I do think that there's a compelling case for an abuse of discretion here when we know that the backdrop is generally you should have just one judgment at the end of the case. When we know that they are fully protected and they're going to get their money, they got every they got the benefit of the arbitration. The purpose of the of the arbitration was so that the insider debt claims could be resolved quickly and cleanly. They were resolved quickly. Well, they, if I'm your friend at the other table, I think my rejoinder to that would be, no, they haven't gotten the benefit of that arbitration because they still haven't gotten the money. The money is in the bank and it's out of my client's pocket. Well, but that's not quite the same thing. Is yeah, it? It, it's pretty darn close. <laughs> but, the, but the big problem is at the other end of the table, there's, they're offering no protections to, to my client in the event. But I, I think you put those three things together and you've got 
an abuse of discretion. I mean, that's 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 so if, if you were if you were the the judge of the second district court of appeal writing this opinion, how would you how would you construct this to say that this under these circuits? I mean, is it just like this is a one-off circumstance that this is under these unique facts, this was an abuse of discretion? Is that what you're advocating? Well, the first thing I would say is they argued below that this was one interrelated case. So, you know, they can't stand up here and argue that these are two separate cases. And so that that, that supports the um, the execution on the arbitration judgment by the rest. They made the, the straight up argument uh, is in the record at 47 that these cases are um, inseparable, um, that they're, they're interrelated. So that's the first fact. So we've got, I think that puts us back in the territory of what would happen in the event of a single case. If this were a single case, your honors would have no difficulty, um, um, ruling that a trial judge erred in executing so, yes, not a partial part of the judgment. What you do, all you are advocating for this court to adopt is to say, treat this as if it were a single case. Or that the result, because of the important policies behind- You can, you can rules, sense the complications with that, right? That we're going to pretend that two separate lawsuits that were not consolidated, which even if they were consolidated, would still retain their separate identity. Now we're going to merge them together. Can you see where that would complicate the law? I think, but when the parties essentially agree that the cases are inter interrelated and inseparable, I think that there is a strong point to be to, to, to be made that you shouldn't allow one of the parties to execute on the case before the entire case is over with. I, I, I think it's as simple as that. And but but doesn't the fact that those those other those claims were resolved by arbitration sort of take this out of the realm of the general principle that there should just be one judgment? I mean you've got mandatory requirements that when the motion to confirm is filed, the judgment be entered. It, it's a shall. Um, you know, that, that the order be confirmed and the judgment be entered. So we're, the fact that they're interrelated, I think would be much more relevant if we were here arguing, you know, over 9.11, okay. But we've got statutory requirements. So how do those fit in? Well, I, I think they fit in, but the wrong way for them. They made precisely that argument to the trial panel judge. Judge, you don't have any discretion because the arbitration rule says you have to enter judgment, but that's, absolutely wrong. If you look at the carpet concepts case and the other two cases that we cited, the architectural sheet metal Well, the case. court entered judgment in those cases, but suspended um, execution. Right. Well, we, we asked for two different types of relief. We would be happy with either. One would be to just withhold entry of the judgment. If you're uncomfortable with that, then the second part of that relief that we asked for was, okay, let them enter the judgment, but stay execution on that judgment until the rest of the case is resolved. That's precisely the result that Judge Altenburn in the carbon concepts case said might make sense under those circumstances. And certainly we think it makes sense under the circumstances that, that, uh, that we, uh, we, we have here. So I, I think the judge exercises discretion, but exercises discretion in part based on the, on the, uh, on the, the misunderstanding that, that, that he had absolutely no discretion at all. And I think that the, the law is clear. If you look at the case law that he cited, the judge does in fact have discretion. Sir, he's got to confirm the award. The confirming the award is different from entering the judgment. And it's certainly different from the judge exercising the discretion that judge always has to stay a portion of the case in favor of other litigation, which is what happened in the three cases that, uh, that we've cited for, 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 uh, for the court and, and, and relied in, in our brief. Let me ask you another question about, about the timing of everything. You didn't move to stay the execution until after the judgment had been entered, correct? No, we uh, I'm sorry, you did, you did it before. You did it before the judgment was entered. We asked for two different types of relief. One, we asked for a stay of the entry of the judgment. Right. And it said conditionally, if you enter the judgment, then go ahead and enter the a, um, a stay of the judgment. Okay, so there, there was never a post-judgment motion to stay execution. Well, then... Uh, there was never, you never moved post-judgment for a stay of the execution. What you're saying is we are on appeal of the um, 
arbitration judgment right. and your motion is part and parcel of the appeal from the final arbitration uh, judgment. Because it was a ruling that the judge made prior to the entry of final judgment and the uh, appeal from that judgment. We've argued to the court uh, to the court below and now our argument is your honor that the judgment shouldn't have been entered at all. So we think that the, that's all part and parcel of the uh, appeal. From the Mr. Brown, you, you're down to five minutes. Did you want to save that for a rebuttal? Um, yeah, I think I'd just be repeating myself if I said anything more. So I'll be waiting uh, for the rest of my time. Thanks. I believe. <clears throat> Good morning again, may it please the court. Josh Webb here from the Ward Anderson on behalf of the athletes. The outcome from the trial court should be affirmed. There was no abuse of discretion in denying appellant's requested stays. The underlying case, this underlying case, is over, and appellant concedes it. Appellant is just making an unsupported and untimely <laughs> request to avoid paying on his loss. Mr. Webb, can you help me like, with one point and don't go outside the record if it's necessary, but it just, it kind of, it did get me scratching my head a little bit. Usually when you have an arbitration that arises or, is, or as a result of a filed lawsuit, once the arbitration's over, the dust settles, whoever wins, seeks to confirm it in the existing lawsuit. I, I hadn't seen it done this way before where you got an extent lawsuit from which the arbitration derives, but then file a new lawsuit to confirm the award on that arbitration. Is there anything in the record that tells us kind of what what's going on and what what was the what was the reason for that? Well, I think it's a little bit of an uh, absence to some degree in the record, okay. and, and the difference is this case, this arbitration, did not arise out of a lawsuit. The parties, these parties sat down and they negotiated and agreed to an arbitration agreement about the disputes that they were going to take to arbitration. That is in the record um, and, and it was addressed by the court this morning already. But what happened is when the mediation that's provided for that agreement failed and everybody was sizing up what was going to happen with their arbitrable claims, uh, appellant uh, initiated arbitration first. But what he did before initiating the arbitration was to go out and file an entirely separate lawsuit um, that really was seemingly a tactical maneuver um, to set something up and you know perhaps avoid the implication or the outcome of arbitration, which is really exactly what he's seeking to have happen now, trying to outrun the outcome of the arbitration that he doesn't like. So the, okay, so I, I think I'm understanding what you're saying is that the, the, the distinction here is that this did not, because this didn't really get referred to arbitration as, as we would say sometimes in an existing lawsuit, it just, it, by happenstance, there was an existing lawsuit that got filed by the other side that brought up all these other claims that went in tandem with the arbitration and the two are, the two are distinct things. I think it's what I'm hearing you say. To use appellant's term, if there is any happenstance, yes, it's the lawsuit that was the happenstance, okay. not this arbitration and the case that we're here about today. Okay. I, th I, think I, I think that gives me a little bit better. Thank you. So there are multiple reasons why this appeal should not succeed. The trial court explicitly recognized and exercised its discretion. The appeal itself is untimely and can be dismissed. Appellant's arguments have no factual or, as we heard again today, legal support. An appellant actually waived his position and should be stopped from serving it here. Further, appellant's arguments are outweighed by Florida policy, both from courts and the legislature, in favor of arbitration. Appellant's position really seeks to undermine the separateness and finality of arbitration to allow appellant to outrun the outcome from arbitration here runs the risk of providing guidance for other litigants seeking to avoid arbitration outcomes that they just don't want. So the court really just needs a handful of points from the record and the briefs to show that this is not about a single dispute, not about a single case. Appellant's briefs notably avoid explaining appellant's own initiation of separate proceedings. He did that. He filed a separate lawsuit 
then arbitration was initiated. The real scenario here is even further removed from what Appellant portrays in the briefs. This is not about overlapping litigation. Even if at some point there was some efficiency to be gained, say through the discovery process, what this case is now about is an attorney's fee award after the substantive claims and arbitration were resolved and a judgment on that attorney's fees award. There's no efficiency to be gained. The substantive issues in this case in the arbitration were fully resolved. Appellant conceded that at the trial court, has conceded that in this court. This was never about a single dispute. The parties had various disputes between some of the same parties over years of different events. Was there some commonality in terms of witnesses and documents, things like that? Certainly, but this was not a single dispute. And we have to look no further than Appellant's own statements, which are in the record. And this is from his response to the motion to compel arbitration, where he explicitly argued that the claims were not related. And that's at the record, pages 319. Let me just ask you a question. If, for example, the court below had stayed execution of the judgment, would that be an abuse of discretion? The court certainly has discretion. So in other words, this could have gone both ways. The coin flip went in your favor. It could have gone the other way, but it didn't. Take the case and the facts as you find them. On the discretionary standard, the court is, the trial court is recognized to be closer to those facts, weighed the facts and circumstances here, and came out on our side to say that staying execution, staying entry of the judgment was not the right call because of the separateness of the proceedings. Could we have taken, we argue that a different finding would have been an abuse of discretion. I think that that would be the closer call. Here, the argument that separate proceedings initiated by the appellant himself are now somehow related enough to stay and have a trial court monitor, you know, proceeds that should be, you know, paid to my clients for having prevailed in arbitration. That's the real, that, you know, that would be the real abuse of discretion and presents all sorts of practical concerns about what trial court judges should be doing or shouldn't be doing as between two entirely separate proceedings. So here, there was no misunderstanding or misapplication of the law. The record is clear. The trial court judge stated at two separate hearings that he, the court understood his discretion and that he was exercising it. And those record, those transcripts from the hearings are in the record at 391 and at 426 through 429. When it came to the appeal itself, the appellant made the appeal on an untimely basis. The rehearing motion that appellant filed below was all about stay of entry of the judgment or stay of execution. And we heard again this morning that both of those motions were filed before judgment was entered, denied before judgment was entered. Those were appellant's other motions. They weren't the final judgment itself. So the rehearing motion that appellant filed did not hold his time for this appeal and it was untimely. He had 30 days to seek relief from the orders denying his motions for stay. Or if he had filed a post-judgment motion to stay execution, he would have had 30 days from the denial of that motion. Appellant filed this appeal 77 days after his time for doing so started. Appellant's arguments in his briefs about that are again, just an elevation form over substance. What he's really here about, what he argued below was staying entry of judgment, staying execution, not about any substance of the final judgment itself. That's been conceded. He has no challenge. He's made no challenge. Those motions, the motion to stay entry and execution were properly denied. Appellant's arguments have no factual support. Appellant even asked in his brief and asked the court again this morning to assume there was no arbitration agreement. In essence, that no arbitration even took place. That's a hypothetical that just doesn't apply here. And it's by appellant's own agreement that an arbitration took place and then separate claims were litigated to finality separately. As for a lack of legal support, again, it's nearly admitted. Appellant is relying on inapposite authority, cases that are concerned with premature appeals all in a single case when there's concerns about substantive rulings going up on various appeals and courts having to deal with those things on a piecemeal basis. That is not this case. 
There is no substantive appeal to make here. Appellant admitted there is no challenge, claiming that there's minor differences between the cases as was done in the reply brief is really quite an understatement. The differences between the cases are substantial and material. They deal with singular occurrences, <clears throat> single wrongful acts. This case is not those cases. So when courts are really considering and talking about stays, they describe the trial court's discretion as considerable latitude, broad discretion, in addition, there's deference to governing statutes and procedural rules. We have that here. The Florida Arbitration Statute that's at issue, 682.12, where the statute provides court shall issue a conferring order, shall enter a judgment. It weighs in the analysis for the trial court. There has to be deference given to the statute. The legislature is requiring courts to enter conferring orders and judgments, absent enumerated grounds for challenge. Such a challenge did not exist in this case. The legislature intended to encourage arbitration of disputes as a speedy and economical alternative to court litigation, and that's included in the cases we cited throughout our answer brief. There's encouragement and protection of arbitration to avoid and reduce litigation, not increase it like we have going on here. So the appellant wants the court to ignore the lack of factual and legal support, ignore the clear policy of supporting arbitration, its separateness and finality, and find an abuse of discretion where he has provided really no particulars about how or when that occurred. The record does not support appellant. The law does not support appellant. There are two more brief points about why the court should affirm the outcome from the trial court. That is that appellant waived his position. He did not request a stay from the arbitrator of the payment of the award that's at issue here for attorney's fees. In fact, when the disbursement came down, he did not object to the payment that was made out of his own funds in the arbitration. But now appellant takes a position that he doesn't want to pay the remainder. Well, appellant waived that position, and we've cited cases in our briefs that waiver can and does occur in the context of arbitration. So why didn't appellant do or say anything? He would have been contradicting his earlier position in front of the arbitrator, now arguing that payment should await resolution of other litigation and that it's related, even though he previously said it was not related, which goes to the final point about appellant being stopped from denying separate proceedings. Appellant opposed the state court claims being heard together in arbitration and prevailed, which establishes judicial estoppel. He can't take these different positions now. Appellant's arguments were clear, as I stated earlier, found in the record at 319 to 320, stating that none of his state court claims, separate state court lawsuit, or even the elements of those claims were related to the claims that were the subject of arbitration. The trial court should be affirmed. The record does not support appellant. The law does not support appellant. The trial court understood and properly exercised its discretion, and Florida law has a clear policy of supporting the separateness and finality of arbitration. The arbitration here is over. Appellant concedes there is nothing left. This case is over, and the court should affirm. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Mr. Brown, you've got your five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. So why is there an abuse of discretion here? Because, number one, this is all form and no substance. The only reason we're here today is because of two very unusual events. So this is very much a one-off sort of case. One is the party's agreement that they're only going to split one very small portion of this case off to arbitration, and in their agreement say that everything else has to be litigated in court. That's a relatively unusual situation. And then number two, as I think you put your finger on something, Judge Lucas, when you asked the question about why did you do this in a separate proceeding, that's very unusual. I've never seen it happen this way before. Normally, they would have been back in front of the same judge confirming the arbitration, and then what would have happened? We would not, they would not have been able to execute until the entire case is done. So you're talking about allowing a kind of an unusual tactical decision by the other side to cleverly file this confirmation in another case to drive the result, when we all know that the result that Florida law compels is that you don't have an execution on a judgment when there's one dispute between the parties until the end of the case. And so when the judge 
exercised his discretion, um, he overlooked that, that tactical element completely. So, secondly, so lawyers can use rules and rules of law tactically to advance their client's interests. I'm sure you have before. Absolutely. Um, and judge, but judges can see through those sort of tactical decisions and decide that there is a more important principle in play and make a decision based upon that more important principle. Nobody argues the principle uh, that we're, we're suggesting applies here. Is that one judgment, one execution at the end of the case. It, when the judge exercised his discretion, I think there was two misunderstandings. One, you heard a lot about how this is a separate case and that they, they were just arguing it would be convenient to litigate them together. No, listen to what they said at the record on, uh, on uh, page 47, quote, all of Tornello's claims arise out of the same underlying facts and relate to identical issues. The claims are, quote, inherently inseparable from the main claims. That's a pretty strong statement. So when you, you, you and I think to suggest in the face of that statement that these are separate proceedings, uh, that was wrong. And I think the judge just had a misunderstanding. And finally, the, there was the judge's misunderstanding about whether in fact he had discretion. He did. So for all those reasons, we think the judge was exactly the use of discretion. Thank you. We'll go to the next case. Joe Perez and versus Kimberly Ann Perez Moore. Hello. 